is there actually any evidence for the Exodus? Well, no, there's no archaeological evidence. How might we respond to the claim that we frequently hear that there's no evidence for the Exodus? Well, it depends whom you ask. <laughs> I guess you're asking me. <laughs> Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. You may recall around a month ago that Dr. Joshua Bowen joined me to address a video by Dr. Sean McDowell and Titus Kennedy on archaeological finds for the Old Testament. Well, that was just one part in a series of interviews on Sean's channel. Well, my guest today, Dr. Titus Kennedy, is an archaeologist. He's an author of a great book called Unearthing the Bible that we're going to get into today. And he's a professor with me at Biola University. And he takes a contrarian position on the Exodus and thinks there's some very good evidence we're going to unpack today. And my guest today is friend of the channel, Dr. Bart Ehrman, author of an array of popular and academic books with an upcoming online course called Finding Moses, what scholars know about the Exodus and Jewish law. If you're interested in signing up, the link is on screen and in the description, which will help support this channel, but we'll get more into that later in the video. For now... Well, let's just jump right in. There's so much we can, we can talk about here. And I want to know from you first, what is the common view among modern historians and archaeologists about the Exodus and the subsequent wandering in the desert? Well, today, the vast majority of scholars in many different fields would view the Exodus as mythical. And so they're saying it, it basically never happened. You know? Most historical scholars don't think that events like the Exodus happened, that these are very, very large exaggerations of what happened. The main reason I think really falls into two different categories. One is coming from a, an ideological or a, a scholarly perspective, going back to the documentary hypothesis. It's saying that the, the Hebrew Bible, especially the earlier books, were written much later than they claim to be by anonymous authors and that a lot of it was just propaganda so they're saying it's it's unhistorical and that's the the schematic that they're looking at when they're looking at these early biblical stories and so they're they're presupposing essentially that they shouldn't be historical even and so it was essentially decided in academia and it's a settled question and so very few people are really looking into is there new evidence for the Exodus? Well, I don't think the philosophical argument works. I don't know him at all, and so I can't really comment on him personally. If he's at Biola, I assume that he's an evangelical. And a lot of evangelicals have this idea that they beat like a drum, that if you don't agree with these things, it's because you have an anti-supernaturalist bias, and that's a philosophical problem you've got. And so I, you know, I get that. And a lot of it is, I mean, it's, it's not just absence of evidence. But there is a striking absence of evidence, I will say that. I believed in the Exodus until I saw the evidence that it didn't happen. <laughs> and so it wasn't that I didn't start off with a philosophical thing. That never could have happened. It's a miracle. I didn't start that way. I just started to look at the evidence. And if we're thinking about well, what kind of archaeological evidence is going to be left behind, this uh, partial slave population that exits the country, there really shouldn't be much. We really shouldn't expect to find much of anything. And it really shouldn't be surprising, actually, if we found nothing a 600,000 person army male army not counting the old men and the women and the children you're talking two and a half three million people who go out and there's nothing left no pottery no arms no silver no nothing that's discovered that at least should make you wonder wow why would that be uh, this is something that egyptologists would tell you that the ancient egyptians in their official or royal annals did not record their losses or their embarrassments and so if that is the kind of event that we're looking for, we're not going to find it. Yeah, well, people say that all the time for that kind of thing to explain the absence of evidence. He's not talking though, about archaeology there. He's saying that there's no literary record. And part of the problem is that there are literary records that show that it probably didn't happen. <laughs> now, we can't demonstrate that it happened if we have an absence of evidence, but we also can't demonstrate that it didn't happen just because we haven't yet found something. For one thing, we know about the rule of Ramses the second, for example. And we know he and his army did not drown in the Red Sea <laughs> or the Sea of Reeds. And so there's literary counter evidence without having Egyptians. So you don't have to have the Egyptians say, yeah, we lost two million of them the other day. <laughs> there, there are other things in the literary record that show us that, in fact, we probably didn't. Sometimes claims are made that the population figures in Exodus and Numbers of the 100,000s are not translated correctly, and the real number should be in the tens of thousands. 
it's first of all, it's it's plausible based on the options we have for translating this particular Hebrew word. So if that were the case, then the common translations in the English Bible that has hundreds of thousands might be mistaken and lead to different expectations in terms of the archaeological evidence we would find. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Kennedy subscribes to the idea that in Numbers 1 and Numbers 26, where we get the listing of the men, that perhaps the Hebrew word elep which is translated as thousands, may well be referring instead to a clan. So six and 40 clans instead of six and 40,000. Do you think that there is anything you could possibly hang his hat on on a mistranslation? Over the years, I've known lots of very serious Semitic linguists. I've got one who's a colleague in my department now. When I served on the New Revised Standard Version Translation Committee as a secretary for that committee, I was around some of the most brilliant Hebrew linguists in the world and hearing them talk <laughs> Hebrew linguistics. And none of them think that's as I see. <laughs> so I don't know, but you got to come up with something. You got to come up with something. That's, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. So yeah, or maybe it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean 640 million soldiers. It means like, uh, you know, whatever, some, uh, some clans. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I would date the Exodus to the 15th century BC. And in uh, Egyptian terms, this would be during the 18th dynasty. I don't think that we can solve it hermeneutically. We're going to always be okay. running around each other's circles. But what we can do then is evaluate the archaeological evidence for these different chronological frameworks and see which is the one that seems to, to yield the, the archaeological evidence for the Exodus or the, or the best, uh, most clear evidence. Mm -hmm. And I would say the 18th dynasty does. And that's what we can look at today. As Sean said up front, Titus is in a contrarian position, even among those who strongly affirm an exodus. There have been long debates among scholars about when are we supposed to imagine these events happening. Dating the exodus is a little bit tricky, but most scholars today agree that it was sometime in the middle of the 13th century. The book of Exodus doesn't tell you its date, and it doesn't tell you when Moses was living. But since it does mention this town, Pi Ramses, we know when the town is built. I mean, it's in relationship to Ramses II, who was in the middle of the 13th century. Where Titus's candidate, Amenhotep II, in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, was ruling 200 years before that city was built. I think one of the, the more difficult ones actually might be uh, a little bit more connected to when the Exodus happened, 15th century, okay. 13th century, those are the two main and this, this city named Ramses, right? And we could get into it and explain it, and I could give you a, an argument why I think it works in the 15th century too, but that, that actually doesn't remove the Exodus from history. It just might be putting it in a different period and, and reinterpreting some of those numbers we talked about earlier. But if you change the date, you get new conflicts. If the puzzle piece of the Exodus doesn't fit anywhere with the historical pieces, maybe it's just from a non-historical puzzle. If we have evidence of Hebrews living in Egypt prior to the Exodus, and then evidence of Hebrews popping up in Canaan after the Exodus, that is the general story that we've got. And, you know, hopefully we would at least be able to demonstrate those two things. Otherwise, we really can't say that we have archaeological or historical evidence for the Exodus. We just say we have an ancient text that tells us. Do we have reason to believe that the Hebrews were actually living in Egypt the time that the book of Exodus would describe that they were there? I would start more broadly with, is there evidence that Semites were living in what the Bible calls the land of Goshen prior okay. to the Exodus? And as far as Semites living there, yes, definitely. We have a huge amount of evidence. It's several different archaeological sites like Tel Abdaba, which is a very important site. We've got Tel Retaba, we've got Tel Maskuda, we tell Yehudia. So these are all sites where we have Semites living during what is called the Second Intermediate Period. Uh, and 18th dynasty in some of those sites also. So that idea is fine. Uh, Egyptian artwork shows immigration and text shows immigration into Egypt uh, from Canaan. It's an important point because we do have solid records of some Semitic peoples immigrating to Egypt, possibly during times of drought at different periods of Egyptian history. We don't have any record of anything like what's described in the Bible in the sense of them taking over Egypt or anything, except with the Hyksos. I don't know if you're going to get to the Hyksos in a minute or not. But so we certainly have records of people coming into Egypt because when there's drought in other places, because of the Nile, usually the droughts don't affect Egypt as much as other places. And so that's kind of a natural place to go. And if you're going to be going, 
you got to be close enough. And so Semitic peoples from the northern parts are going to be coming down. And that does happen. And we do have one letter that was written at the time that describes Semitic people escaping from Egypt, a small, a small group. And so that leads most people to think that what's going on is that the, if you talk about, say, people from Latin America immigrating to the United States, and you have a story about a family that immigrates, it's kind of a sensible story because people know that happens. So if you make up a story about a Semitic group going down into Egypt, you know, there's nothing kind of weird about that. It'd be kind of weird if, if there was a famine in Judea and they immigrated to Japan. That would be weird. But this is just kind of something that happens. But it, it has no bearing on whether this story is true. It just means that it contextually, yeah, this kind of thing happened. We have uh, on Papyrus Brooklyn this list of servants in Egypt from about the 17th century BC. And many of the names of these servants were Semitic names. Some of these Semitic names are actually names that we find for Hebrews in the Bible. The Semitic languages are all very similar to one another. And so I don't know if he does a specific analysis to argue that this is specifically Hebrew versus some other Semitic language or not. I'm not familiar with his argument on that. I mean, that would be interesting, but I, I mean, Semitic languages, are, I don't I don't know. I mean, they're, they're very similar. That's why scholars who are studying the Hebrew Bible, who really are experts in the Hebrew Bible, have to learn Ugaritic and Akkadian and Sumerian and things, because these are closely related languages. And so there are many things that are in common among them. And so I don't know about some of these names. I really can't say anything about it. Probably one of the best known and really a great visual comes from the tomb of this official Rekmira. And on part of the walls there, there's a scene in which it shows foreign slaves, some of whom are Semitic, making mud bricks. Do you have any idea on what basis Dr. Kennedy is concluding that the people in the illustration are Semitic? I don't know why it shows that. Me neither. The accompanying text identifies them only as captives. I think Titus overspoke his evidence here. But if he does, again, I don't see that it has any bearing on whether it's a verification of what happens in the book of Exodus. If I write a novel about something that happened in place in New York City, and I describe a Jew, and in 2,000 years, somebody reads my novel and says, oh, the novel never must have happened because we now know that there were Jews in New York City. Well, <laughs> Why does that make my novel right? <laughs> the same objections hold for Titus's next three items. One of the Hermitage papyri that also talks about immigrant people. The Louvre or Louvre leather roll, does that support this case as well? It does. That one specifically looks at mud brick making and quotas. The Ipperwer papyrus. What is this? In general, it's a poem that is talking about destruction and death throughout the land of Egypt, but there are linguistic and thematic parallels between what Ippur is writing and the Exodus story or the Exodus plague. Which merely vaguely describe foreign workforces, brick building techniques, and in this last one, the sun going dark and general pestilence. But again, Hebrews are not specified and the parallels are a stretch. Let me just tell you, listeners, when people make claims like that, what you really need to do is start digging into them a bit, not take their word for it. So this is admittedly built on some debate about the dating of it and the interpretation. So it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's plausible. Exactly. Plausible meaning confirmation only if you already believe. It, we also couldn't say that this is definitive evidence. So if your chronology is, is correct, which pharaoh would have ruled during this time? I would take the position that the pharaoh at the time of the Exodus was Amenhotep II. We see in the Exodus story that the Pharaoh is depicted as extremely arrogant and stubborn. Mm. And Amenhotep is exactly that kind of Pharaoh. He even wrote in his own text that he was the greatest king that had ever existed. <laughs> wow. And then he talks about crazy feats, like he could shoot arrows through a, the thick bronze target, which is physically just not possible. Or, or he could row a boat by himself faster than a whole crew of sailors. He was at the head of his army, supposedly killing all of his enemies and the foreign princes by himself. So he really seemed to be compensating for something. Titus's contrarian circumstantial evidence starts with an interpretation that a pharaoh of Egypt had a strong sense of self-confidence. Would confident not describe every single pharaoh? Yeah, 
<laughs> no, there's that, but it's also, even if it's psychologically plausible, authors do try to make the character psychologically plausible. So I don't, I, I just don't get it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like the one apologetic, but it's like the, the argument. I don't get that argument. <laughs> rather than bolstering a psychological profile, this serves rather to demonstrate how unreliable and hyperbolic ancient history can be. No, but I mean, whether it's historical or not, I don't see how that's an argument for that this really happened with a real pharaoh. I mean, if it's something that kind of makes sense and is known about in the environment, that's what you, when you write a fiction, that's what you do. You use what, what's known about in the environment. So does he have an argument for why that makes it historical? We have, as you said, Moses, he kills the Egyptian. He flees into the wilderness. He's there for 40 years. Then God tells him, hey, the pharaoh who is pursuing you has died. You can go back to Egypt now. Well, that seems to indicate that the pharaoh who was in power when Moses left continued to rule for those 40 years. Mm. And so we're essentially looking for the pre-Exodus pharaoh who has a reign of 40 or more years. Now, there are hardly any pharaohs in Egyptian history who, who rule more than wow. 40 years. Yeah, pro yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, sure. But, I mean, there are other problems with it, of course. I don't know if we're going to get out of Ramses or not. But, I mean, <laughs> Ramses did reign for 66 years, but Titus rejects Ramses' timing. He likes 200 years before that. Well, okay, but I mean, they built the city by Ramses, <laughs> which is, that's one of the cities that the Israelites build, and it was built in the 13th century. And so, you know, you're not going to have a city named after the pharaoh if the pharaoh hasn't existed yet. <laughs> the next pharaoh, so Thutmose IV, he was the son of Amenhotep II, who okay. became the next pharaoh. He seems to be needing divine endorsement to legitimize his role as the next king. Because the thing is, Thutmose IV was not the firstborn son and heir of Amenhotep II. Anyway, we know that Thutmose IV was not the firstborn son, and his older brother, who was the heir, disappeared mysteriously, so he seeks divine endorsement. Again, if these plagues happen and the firstborn of Pharaoh died, then we would expect something like this to happen. Why would the firstborn son have been killed during the Exodus? During the Passover. During Passover, uh, the killing of the firstborns, right? Oh, ha! I see. Oh, that's clever. Okay, yeah. So the Pharaoh's son got killed, the firstborn son got killed during the Passover, and so the secondborn son had to become the ruler. Right. He's trying to point to where in history that may have happened. Is that at least a, a data point that someone who's trying to make the story fit should have to work yet? Here's my view of this. If you think the story is literally true, then you start finding data points because it's literally true. Then you use the data points to say it's literally true. That's known as arguing in a circle. So that's why I'm having trouble understanding this entire line of argument. The question is, when is this event likely to have happened according to the Bible itself? And then is it plausible that it happened? You can't just start <laughs> saying it did happen, therefore it must have happened at this date. The question is, did it happen? <laughs> now, last piece of this puzzle. Is there evidence after this? I know the conquest itself is debatable, and we could do that a whole other time. I think there are all sorts of problems with historicity. Within the parts I'm going to be talking about in my course, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you've got major events that transpire, and you want to know, you know, did they happen or not? And so the Exodus itself, you've got Moses leading these two or three million people out of Egypt. And what's the plausibility of this happening? What body of water would they be crossing that would drown the entire Egyptian army? For example, they're not at the Red Sea. It's called the Sea of Reeds. And so it's usually thought to be one of the lakes up in the no northeast part of the Delta. So we're, And how do you get two million people out of Egypt when probably the population of Egypt couldn't have been two million people? So how does... And so... And why is there no... Why... why when I was an evangelical, we, we learned that there were chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. <laughs> and so that proved, right, that's just made up. Not to divert too much, but since you mentioned the famous chariot wheel claim, that's still advocated by some evangelicals like Kent Hovind. Chariot wheels? Oh, how would a chariot wheel end up down there in the bottom of the Red Sea? Whoa. And they found four, six, and eight spoke chariot wheels. All four, all three. Let's take a minute to acknowledge that Dr. Kennedy did take a minute to also debunk this for his audience. So I do have to ask you about this. What, what do you make of the chariot wheels supposedly found at the bottom of the Red Sea? Is that true? Is that an urban legend that's been passed? Because I've been told that many times as a kid. What do you make of that data? So the, the chariot wheels, allegedly, that are shown are either a type of coral reef, so it's a specific species of coral that actually forms this structure that looks kind of like a wheel popping up from the, the ground with an axle. Uh -huh. It's not 
coral that grew over chariot wheels. wheels it, it's found all throughout the Red Sea. And then, you know, you may have seen some pictures or, or video of some kind of four-spoke looking gold wheel, right? That's yeah. not a, an ancient Egyptian chariot wheel either. And, and it wouldn't be on the surface of the sand like it was displayed. So there's no chariot wheels or chariots that were found in, in the Red Sea there. So kudos for that intellectual honesty. Great. But sorry, you were saying... And so you get the historical problems with the Exodus. You get the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It's a little bit confusing why they go to Mount Sinai. They're trying to get to the promised land. And if they just go up the coast, it's 100 miles or so. So it's a couple of weeks. But instead, they go down, they go south, and they go to Mount And we don't even know where, where Mount Sinai is. But then you get the whole law thing. The law thing takes up most of the section of the Pentateuch. And so you have to figure out, are there things about these laws that make it look like they were like given all at one time and they're not a coherent whole? And Yes, there are, and they're internal con contradictions. But then you start getting to the point you're asking, which is in the book of Numbers, they start conquering the promised land. And what they do is that they're down on Mount Sinai, they're given the law, and because they disobey God, he decides that that generation cannot go into the promised land. So they've got to wander around the wilderness for 40 years so that all those people can die off. But the, most of the time, 38 years, they stay in this place called Kadesh Barnea. So you have these 2 million people staying at Kadesh Barnea, no archaeological record of them being there. Like there are no swords or anything. They must have had swords <laughs> if they're going to conquer the promised land. And that's another question. Where did they get the they just They just walked around walls, Bart. Come on. Yeah, well, yeah they walked around walls, they, but they went in and killed everybody with the sword. Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, why were they smelting these swords? But, so, but anyway, you start, get up to the, in the numbers, you start getting them going up in the Transjordan. And this is a huge problem. I mean, is did you have a 600,000 person army storming the Transjordan. So even if you say, look, it's an exaggeration, it doesn't really mean 600,000, it means, you know, 640 clans or whatever he thinks it is. Why isn't there evidence of mass destruction at that point? Why isn't there archeological evidence of cities being leveled? There have been extensive, even when you get into the book of Joshua, which would be a different course I'm gonna do. When they actually go into the central part and they destroy Jericho, there have been lots of, <laughs> lots of archaeology done in Jericho, and there simply wasn't a big walled city there at the time. And there are all sorts of problems in both archaeological and literary, the literary being things that, that it's quite clear that nothing like this could have happened given the literary remains from Egypt, from other places. And so, right. So, yes, I do think that, that the remains problem and the, there's a problem when it comes to the conquest itself, which begins in numbers, but then, of course, continues mainly in Joshua. Yeah, I, I think we can absolutely say, even going beyond the debate about conquest, archaeology, but that there is evidence of settlement of Hebrews, of Israelites in the late Bronze Age, at the end of the late Bronze Age in Canaan. You know, most, most archaeologists and historians would say that, yeah, this is the time that the Israelites emerged in Canaan. Now, maybe I'm missing something, but how would evidence of an Israeli population in the land of Canaan in the 13th century B.C., somehow supports an earlier Exodus story. Oh, it's completely neutral to the Exodus story. It creates certain problems for his dating because why well, isn't there evidence of Israel at the time that he dates it? But there's an inscription that survives of an Egyptian pharaoh saying that he conquered Israel and it's mid 13th century. That's actually the one he talks about, yeah. Yeah, the Merneptah stone. And it's absolutely right. That it, and that does show that by that time, there was a group of people who were calling themselves Israel. It does show that. And that's great. That's fine. That's no, I don't. To say that that shows that the Exodus happened is crazy because that's the kind of evidence everybody agrees. Is. Yeah, there must have been something called Israel there at the time. So the question is, how'd they get there? Where would they come from? And so part of what I'll be dealing with in my course is, where do they, you know, where do they come from? And how does it start there? And, and how do these stories grow and get so exaggerated? So my, I'll tell you my view. I'll tell you right, which is that we have this evidence that you have some S Semitic tribes going down to Egypt, for example, during times of famine. Some of them probably tried to get out of there. Some of them probably didn't get out of there. And Moses is an Egyptian name. It's not a Hebrew name. And so Aaron is an Egyptian name. It's not a Hebrew name. So I think they know about traditions of some people with some names coming out of there. And over the centuries, as these stories are told, they start getting exaggerated and exaggerated and exaggerated. And stories added and expanded. And, and by the time our sources are written centuries later, you've got the, these big stories. It would be crazy to take a little detail of these big stories and say, aha, this happened in the 18th dynasty. Look at that story. Say, so, no, that isn't how history is done. You don't do history that way. 
in my course, I'll be trying to explain what these stories mean. They're very important stories. This part of the Pentateuch, this is about how Israel came into existence and how the law of the Jews was handed on to the Jewish people and how they got the promise. I mean, this is very foundational stuff for understanding ancient Israel and Judaism, then as a result, Christianity. So it's foundational stuff. You've got to understand these books for the literary story they're telling. And you also have to ask how much of this is historical and why do we think so? And so those are the kinds of issues I've been dealing with. I'm not going to be cherry picking a piece of data to say, yeah, this must have taken place in, you know, 1452. <laughs> well, if you want to enroll in Bart's new course, Finding Moses, What Scholars Know About the Exodus and Jewish Law, go to tinyurl.com slash Bart Moses. It's lifetime access to eight 30-minute lectures by Dr. Ehrman with lesson overviews and reflection questions. If you sign up today, there's a limited window for early bird pricing. And if you sign up before November 12th, you can participate in the live recording and the Q&A sessions. Don't miss out on any of Bart's beginner-friendly, while scholarly rich, How Scholars Understand the Bible series to get a real view of what serious thinkers are saying, some of which might shock your pastor and Sunday school teacher. Again, go to tinyurl.com slash bartmoses as on screen or in the description, because by doing so, you'll be financially supporting this channel and the mission of Apologia. So thank you. For more Apologia Bart Ehrman team-ups, tap on the playlist on screen now, and I'll see you over there. All right. Later. Okay, thanks. All right, see ya.